Oh, I made that up. <laughs> it doesn't exist. It sounded good though. We left off with sarcomeres, bottom of page three. So the next item is D, molecular structure of thin filaments. And here's the only three dimensional illustration we have of sarcomeres. And this is where disc comes from. So Z line can be called Z disc, M line can be called M disc. And depending on where you cut through the sarcomere, you'll see different proteins. If you cut between the Z line and the thick filament, then the only thing you'll cut through are thin filaments. Show here. If you cut through the H zone, and you're cutting through only thick, no thin. If you cut through the A band where the thin do overlap, then you'll see both thin and thick. And that's where the numbers come from. Six thin around each thick, three thick around each thick. So you can just pick a thin, say this one, there's three thick around it. Or pick a thick, you'll count six thin around it. So every 60 degrees, there's myosin heads reaching out to grab onto those thin filaments. Bind with them, go through a power stroke, and actually pull them and slide them. Down here under M-line, so this is if you cut through the M-line, you not only see the thick filaments, but you see the structural proteins connecting them. They're calling them accessory proteins. We're going to call them structural proteins. Because you can take all of the proteins in a myofibril, and they're going to fit under one of three categories. They're either contractile proteins, which is just myosin and actin. Or they're regulatory proteins, which is troponin and tropomyosin. Or they're structural proteins, which is everything else. Their job is to provide structure for all of the other proteins, the filaments that make up that myofibril. Right? So myomesin, M-line proteins provide structure for the thick filaments. Line them up, stack them in position. Alpha actin, which forms the Z-disc, gets all of the thin filaments lined up to their proper position. So what we're going to cover next are the contractile proteins of the thin and thick filaments, and then the regulatory proteins associated with them. All right, so starting with the thin filament, whenever we make a fibrous protein, which is just a really long, slender protein, it starts with individual protein subunits. Right, each one of these has tertiary structure. They are globular proteins themselves. In fact, they're called G-actin. G is for globular. But then when you link them together, now you have a huge protein complex with quaternary structure. And because it's very long and slender, it's considered to be a fiber. Looks like a fiber, only by appearance. So the F stands for fibrous actin. 
that you polymerize all the G-actin, you now have F-actin fibers, or filamentous. So the thin filament primarily consists of actin, two long strands that are twisted around each other. It would look similar to taking a pearl necklace, pulling it taut, and then twisting it, and then the two um, layers twist over each other. And then that forms a groove between the two strands. And in that groove lies tropomyosin. When it's in the groove, these binding sites for myosin are exposed and contraction can occur. If we want to stop contraction, then we have to slide that tropomyosin out of the groove and over the binding sites, which is the way it's set up over here. This is relaxed muscle. So here, the yellow is the myosin binding site. But the myosin heads on the thick filament can't bind right now. So no contraction is occurring. Nebulin is a structural protein. It anchors the two filamentous actin molecules. So as they twist around each other, they're, they're really twisting around this bar that goes right through the center. That's nebulin gives F-actin something to twist around. And then the other two proteins are troponin and tropomyosin, the, the regulatory proteins. It looks like tropomyosin is rope-like, kind of a, a braided um, protein. And it looks like it just keeps going and going and going. But really, it's lots of tropomyosin molecules lined up end to end. And each one is about as long as 7G actin. So every seventh G actin, another strand of tropomyosin. And then per strand, there's one troponin. So we got one troponin for this strand, and then here's another strand, another troponin, all the way down. So about every 7G actin, you've got one tropomyosin with one troponin. And troponin has three subunits to it. And each subunit has a binding site. So one of those subunits is actually attached to actin. That anchors troponin to actin. So it stays attached to the thin filament. And then another one of the subunits attaches to tropomyosin. And then the third one is a binding site for calcium. For a better image of troponin, but I'm not seeing one. Where we can see all three subunits. This one's kind of small. But here's tropomyosin in this case, purple, here's troponin pink. And the green thing attached to it is calcium. So when calcium is bound to the TNC subunit of troponin, that causes troponin to change shape. It's called a conformational change. And when it undergoes that conformational change, it slides tropomyosin. So imagine I'm troponin, and the top of my head is the binding site for calcium, and then I've got a binding site anchored to actin, and a binding site anchored to tropomyosin. And when calcium binds to my head, I go like this. Just some kind of a change in shape. 
enough to pull tropomyosin away from its inhibitory position, which it's in right now. This is the inhibitory position of tropomyosin. So if we can slide it just a little bit off of those myosin binding sites, now contraction can begin. So the groove, can you show me where that groove is that you mentioned earlier? It's, it, it's not, the binding sites are on the, on the, ex, on the exterior and the groove's in the middle, right? So a groove between the, the two strands of actin. So if we can slide it down into that groove, that'll get it off of these myosin binding sites. So when troponin changes shape, it's going to move tropomyosin. And it'll, it'll approach the groove there. It doesn't move very far. It doesn't need to. It just has to get off the binding sites. Here's the thick filament. The main protein of the thick filament is myosin. And it's going to take lots of myosin molecules all bundled together to form one thick filament. So on the very bottom here they're showing you one myosin molecule. And just above that a bunch of myosin molecules bundled together. Their tails collectively form the thick filament, all of these tails. And then the heads will stick out, not randomly, at every 60 degrees. Stick out this way, and this way, and this way, and this way, and this way, to, to reach out to those six thin filaments that are surrounding each thick. And then you can see Titan here. It's going to run through the core. Here's the M-line proteins, positioning the thick filaments, stacking them up. Up here they show Titan going through the thick filament. And now we're starting to see some illustrations with myosin heads. So when these heads attach to the thin filament, it's called a cross bridge. And as soon as the attachment occurs, it's followed by a power stroke. So this hinge that connects the head to the tail allows the head to pivot. So pivoting of the head is called a power stroke. And that's what pulls the thin filament and slides it across the thick. And that's going to happen repeatedly. It's going to grab, pull a very short distance, not even sure if it's a millimeter, maybe micrometers, just for one power stroke. Detach, re-energize, re grab again, power stroke. Detach, re-energize, grab again, power stroke. With lots of myosin heads doing this at the same time, the, the thin filaments begin to slide across the thing. But it's going to take lots and lots of them, all working together. To make sure that the thin filament when the myosin head lets go, doesn't go back to where you started. At any given time, about half of the myosin heads are attached and in the middle of a power stroke. The other half are detached and getting re-energized. So as soon as the half that uh, finished the power stroke finish the power stroke, the other half are, are already binding and ready to keep it going. So it just keeps going and going and going. And those IP tutorials will, will show that uh, to you with animations. On the bottom right, they're showing you the binding sites on the myosin head. So what, what is an ATPase? Enzyme. It's a binding site, but it's also an enzyme. So when ATP binds, it's really binding to an enzyme. What does that enzyme do? hydrolyzes the ATP to release the energy. That's how you use ATP in hydrolyzing. You break that terminal phosphate bond. And you can see the actin binding site on it.
So myosin heads have actin binding sites. Actin molecules have myosin binding sites, and they get together. Each G actin has a binding site for myosin. Here's the two side by side. Thick filament, myosin tails, myosin head sticking out every 60 degrees. Thin filament with troponin and tropomyosin. One per about seven G actin. One troponin, one tropomyosin. How many subunits form troponin, which has quaternary structure? Three. What's the name of the subunit that binds to calcium? T N C. T N for troponin. C for calcium. Which subunit binds to actin? T N I. I is for inhibitory. And which one binds to tropomyosin? T for tropomyosin. T N T. So here's a real slide of cross bridges, magnification 277,000. <coughs> this is 100 nanometers, teeny, teeny, tiny. You can see the thick filaments. You can see the myosin head sticking out, thin filaments on either side. Right now, they're attached, so that's a cross bridge. When cells stop producing ATP, which happens upon death, rigor mortis occurs. And what's making the muscles stiff? They're actually stuck in a contracted state. Because what you need to detach the myosin head from actin is ATP. Another ATP coming along to bind to that ATPase binding site on the myosin head. And as soon as that ATP comes along and binds, it gets hydrolyzed. It doesn't stay there. It gets hydrolyzed. The energy is used to re the myosin head. It goes through the power stroke. Now you need another ATP to bind to that same binding site to detach it. So every time you go through a power stroke, you need another ATP. And if you stop making it, you get stuck in that cross bridge formation. And it can't detach. The reason the muscles eventually soften up after several hours, just breakdown, degradation of the proteins. Question? That's what I was going to ask. I thought so. <laughs> cool article, by the way. I hadn't seen that one. Oh, you didn't? No, that's awesome. I'm going to send that out to you, all my colleagues. Is that like a new, new, new article? Yeah, well... It came out like a couple days ago. It's been in the news for like two days. Three yeah. days. I don't watch news except ESPN news. <laughs> Sadly. To wrap up the microscopic anatomy, last two things T tubules, sarcoplasmic reticulum, uh, both of which I pointed out last time. Sarcolemma, invaginations, called transverse tubules. Three-dimensionally, you can see that the system of T-tubules will surround every single myofibril. And around every single myofibril, mitochondria. So the ATP needs to be here where the myosin heads are, because that's where it goes, binds to the myosin heads. You've got to release the calcium. Calcium is the key. As soon as it binds to the TNC subunit of troponin, what happens to troponin? Change of shape. Change of shape. And when it changes shape, what moves? Mm 
the myosin moves. And it gets it slides off of its inhibitory position so that it's no longer covering the myosin binding sites on actin. As soon as you expose those binding sites, the myosin heads, which have already been energized, are ready to bind and power stroke right away. So then really the only thing you need ATP for, once contraction has been initiated, is detachment and re-energizing for the next power stroke. But it's already ready for that first power stroke. So you've got to bring the T tubules inside of the cell around the myofibrils. The calcium that's being stored has to be right there around the myofibrils, and it is. You can see it also surrounds every myofibril. And really where the action happens within this SR, sarcoplasmic reticulum, is at the distal ends, right next to the T tubules. And there's a special name for that part of the SR, terminal cisterna. And the way to get calcium released from the terminal cisterna, depolarization of the T tubule membrane. So remember, it has a resting membrane potential. Negative something. In skeletal muscle cells, about negative 85. Minus 80, minus 85. So what does it mean to depolarize that membrane? At rest, it's in a polarized state. How would you depolarize it? Make it more negative or more positive? More positive. So what type of an ion would you bring in across the cell membrane to depolarize it? A positive ion. Got to make the inside more positive. And sodium is the one that moves across. You just have to open sodium channels. So all along the cell membrane and all along the T tubules, which is just more cell membrane, you have voltage-gated sodium channels and voltage-gated potassium channels. The sodium channel is open, sodium flies across the membrane, it depolarizes it, and that's the signal to cause channels in the terminal cisterna, calcium channels, to open and release calcium. To get calcium out, because it's so concentrated in, in the SR, it's just diffusion, facilitated diffusion. Channel has to open to get it out, but the concentration gradient is there. So when it's time to relax the muscle, stop contracting, you've got to get calcium off of the TNC subunits and put it back into storage. So how are you going to get calcium back into the SR? If you use diffusion to get it out, because it's going down its concentration gradient, how are you going to get it in? So what type of transport is that called when you use ATP di directly? Primary active transport. So you can call them calcium pumps. You can call them calcium ATPases. Same with the sodium-potassium pump. It's also known as sodium-potassium ATPase. So the triad is simply one T tubule with a terminal cisterna on each side. Now the reason we covered all the microscopic anatomy first, so you know where and what is involved in all the processes, all the physiology. So when we talk about excitation contraction coupling, that's a process. Where does it happen? At the triads. What part of the triad is being excited? Which means an electrical current is being generated. Depolarization is an electrical current. The T tubule or the terminal cisterna? The T tubule. Depolarize the cell membrane, the current travels down the cell membrane, down the T tubules. What does excitation refer to? Not excitation, what does contraction refer to? Excitation is that current coming down the T tube. Contraction refers to the release of calcium, because it is the trigger, it's the intracellular trigger for contraction. 
excitation contraction coupling, connecting excitation to release of calcium, that happens at the trident. The calcium is released from the terminal cistern. When we talk about the events at the neuromuscular junction, where is that happening? In the gap junctions? So think about the term neuromuscular junction. The nerve ending and the muscle cell, the muscle cell membrane. That's the neuromuscular junction. So here's the end of a nerve fiber, which is also known as an axon. So the end portion is called the axon terminal. And the axon is going to branch distally to form many neuromuscular junctions in a small area. So here's one of them magnified. Here's the muscle cell membrane, axon terminal, small distance between them, nanometers across, very short distance. That's the synaptic cleft. What type of a junction is this? It's a synapse. It's called a synapse wherever a neuron, an axon terminal of a neuron, communicates with another cell. It could be a gland cell, it could be a muscle cell, it could even be another neuron, but it's called a synapse. So the neuromuscular junction is a synapse. And when we get into neurofits, you'll see there's two types of synapses. The, the very rare electrical synapse, where the two are joined by gap junctions. So the axon terminal membrane would be physically connected to the target cell membrane. They would touch, they would be connected by gap junctions, but that's rare. And we only see that between neurons. Most synapses, 99.9% .9 are called chemical synapses. That's what this is. So instead of the two cells physically touching and connecting in, in order to communicate, they get close, then one releases a chemical that binds to a receptor on the other cell. That's a chemical synapse. It uses a chemical messenger. Now what do you call a chemical messenger that uses the bloodstream to reach its target? A hormone. What do you call a chemical messenger that crosses a synaptic cleft to reach its target cell? A neurotransmitter. Because right? only neurons form synapses. So if the chemical is coming from a neuron, from the axon terminal, it's called a neurotransmitter. And again, these are all tutorials in the IP program. The events at the neuromuscular junction, excitation, contraction, coupled, the sliding filament mechanism. So now we've covered all of the anatomy associated with each of these concepts. Now we dig into the physiology, the process. So part three on the study guide, muscle fits, the cellular events involved in contraction. Start with the sliding filament mechanism, also called sliding filament model or sliding filament theory. It results from cross-bridge cycling. So again, cross-bridge cycling involves formation of a cross-bridge, myosin head, binds to actin. That's followed by a power stroke, detachment, re-energization. That's a cycle. That's a cross-bridge cycle. So if you have 10 repeated power strokes, that's 10 cross-bridge cycles. How do you describe the, the sliding filament mechanism? Well, you could say that the thin filaments of each sarcomere slide across the thick filaments towards the M1. Changing the amount of overlap between the thick and thin filaments. So as the thin overlap the thick more and more, what happens to the H zone? It disappears. 
So the Z lines move closer together as they are pulled towards the M line. As that occurs, the width of the H zone decreases. The width of the I band decreases. However, the A band always stays the same. Sliding occurs in every sarcomere along the myofibril and in every myofibril within a myofibril. So when you stimulate a muscle fiber to contract, stimulation occurs at the neuromuscular junction. That motor nerve ending is going to release chemicals that's going to stimulate that muscle cell membrane. Yes, all of the myofibrils and all of the sarcomeres within that one <laughs> cell are going to shorten and contract, but the fibers around that particular fiber within the same fascicle, they're not necessarily going to actively shorten. And that's because you have electrical insulation, endomesium surrounding every myofiber. So one can be stimulated without the others around it being stimulated at the same time. We have very tight control over just how many muscle fibers we are going to use or recruit. Right? A single motor neuron and all of the fibers that it, that it innervates is called a motor unit. So this motor unit would be considered really small. There's only three muscle fibers connected to this one motor neuron. But you can have a motor neuron branch so much that it actually innervates hundreds or thousands of muscle fibers. And if that's the case, all of those 100 or all of those 1,000 muscle fibers will contract, actively contract as the signals come down that one motor neuron. So if we want to generate more and more force, we have to recruit more and more motor units. Make sense? If all I want to do is pick up this pen, I want to be as efficient as possible and only recruit the minimal number of muscle fibers I need to generate enough force to do bicep curls with this pen. If I want to do bicep curls with a 40-pound dumbbell, I'm going to need a lot more muscle fibers. So you're only going to use what you need. Very different from the heart. In the heart, all of the cardiomyocytes <laughs> contract at the same time. They all contribute to force generation, and they all relax at the same time. They're united. In skeletal muscle, we want them separate. How is a muscle cell stimulated to contract? And how does stimulation result in contraction? So first, how is a muscle cell stimulated to contract? A motor neuron is going to release chemicals called neurotransmitters. Happens to be acetylcholine in this case. And once the acetylcholine is released, what's it going to do? It's going to diffuse across that synaptic cleft, which is that space between the two cell membranes. And then what? Bind to myosin's in the cell. We're, we're on the cell right now. The synaptic cleft is outside of the cell membrane. This is the cell membrane just below. So those chemicals are going to... How does one cell communicate with another using chemical signals? So one secretes the chemical, the other has... Receptors for it. So what's going to happen to the ACH, which is acetylcholine? It's going to bind to ACH receptors. Tons of them in this cell membrane right here. 
And notice this part of the cell membrane looks different than the rest of it, which is very flat. Notice here it's indented and it's folded up. So that area is called a motor end plate. Motor end plate. It's a plate at the end of the motor neuron. It houses the receptors that the neurotransmitters are going to bind to. Here they don't show it all folded up, but they still show it indented, and that still represents the motor end plate. So basically, the axon terminal is going to communicate with the motor end plate. It's going to release acetylcholine, which is in turn going to bind to receptors on that motor end plate. So to finish that bottom box there, recall that skeletal muscle contraction is voluntary. It requires a signal from motor nerves. Once the muscle cell is excited, by this electrical signal, contraction follows. The sliding filament mechanism begins. As the muscle fibers contract, tension is produced and transmitted to attached bones by way of connective tissue. So all of those connective tissues in and around the muscle belly, they all join together and they continue past the muscle belly and they form the tendons. The following sections, which include one, events at the NMJ, which stands for what? Neuromuscular, Neuromuscular junction. EC coupling, EC stands for? Excitation, contraction, contraction coupling, and cross bridge cycling. We're going to break up the whole process of muscle contraction into those three phases. Events at the NMJ, EC coupling, cross bridge cycle. So when you're learning something very complex and detailed as this is, it helps to break it up into small chunks. So that's the point of this. And they do the same thing with the tutorials on the IP program. They have one for the sliding filament mechanism, one for events at the neuromuscular junction. And we also have the AMP flicks. Those are also animations that you can find in the study area on, on mastering. So what they're showing you on the right hand side is an overview. A representation of all of those processes. Right, so this would be events at the neuromuscular junction. This is excitation contraction coupling. The T tubule. And what does this red line represent here? Something is traveling, now it's right here. That electrical current that starts at the motor end plate travels across the membrane down the T tubule. So here it is. So that means right here, we're depolarizing the membrane of the T tubule. And that's going to open up channels on the terminal cisternum. So that's EC coupling. And then as soon as the calcium binds to the TNC subunits of troponin, troponin changes shape, slides tropomycin out of the way, then what happens? Crossbridge cycle. As soon as tropomyosin moves from its inhibitory position, cross bridges form and power strokes follow. And the result of sarcomeres shortening, because that's the whole point of sliding the filaments, to shorten the sarcomeres. As the sarcomeres shorten, the myofibrils shorten, so the fibers shorten, so the fascicles shorten, so the entire muscle belly shortens. Now, if we're only actively, and I say actively on purpose, if we're only actively shortening or actively contracting some of the muscle fibers, just enough for me to do bicep curls with nothing. So very, a very small percentage of my muscle fibers are, are being recruited. Why do all of the fibers, all of the fascicles, the entire muscle belly, why does it all shorten if I'm only recruiting a few fibers in that muscle belly? How come everything else is forced to shorten as well? Not actively shorten, passively shorten. 
just a few of the fibers are actively shortened. You, you have to lift that bone from your own ways. So you would require everything, right? Mm -hmm. Doing this is very different than doing this with a 50 pound dumbbell. So like this, I'm, I'm using hardly any muscle fibers. But everything shortens. Visually, you can't tell the difference. If I'm curling air or 50 pounds, it looks the same. Why does everything shorten? Passively, while just a few of the muscle fibers shorten actively. They're all connected together. By what? Connective tissues, yeah. Endomesium, paramecium, epimesium. Starting with the muscle fibers, everything around them is interconnected. So when one actively shortens, it pulls the other one. So the best analogy I can think of, let's say um, we're all going to line up, ten of us, and there's a bar on this side and a bar on this side and we want to pull those bars closer together. If it's really easy to pull them, even though there's 10 of us lined up with our hands on the bar, maybe only two of us actually have to put effort into it. Everybody else just sits there, limp arms, and they just go in for the run. Right? Because they're connected to those bars, everybody's arms are going to get pulled in when those bars come together. But that doesn't mean everybody has to contribute. Make sense? Yeah. So when you say act, Active meaning in that muscle fiber, the sarcomeres are shortening. That's where the cross bridge cycling is happening. So what is shortening in the passive? They're just getting pulled in. Just by way of connective tissue. It's okay. causing the other fibers and fascicles to shorten. They go along for the ride. It doesn't have to cycle. Their filaments aren't sliding. Mm -mm. They're just getting pulled. Because the, the muscle fibers can change length very easily. They can be stretched, elongated, and they can shorten as well. They don't have to shorten uh, actively necessarily. They can just get pulled in by all the connective tissue. Top of page five. So the first of the three chunks. And th this is probably the hardest part of the study guide. Not because it's complicated, but because it's complex. Yeah. There's a lot of steps. And every time I map out the steps on the board, and, and I'll do this a few times with you, it comes out a little different. Sometimes uh, it comes out to 20 steps, sometimes 30 steps, anything in between. There's no one way to break this process up. Because in the end, it's just one continuous process. So whenever we say this is five steps or ten steps, somebody's decided to break it up in this manner. Events at the neuromuscular junction. And there's a section in your book called a focus figure. I think it takes up one or two pages. And they're going to focus on this one process. So here's how I break it down, and the way I describe it in the study guide might be different than the way it's described on this figure and in the book. Muscle cell stimulation begins with an action potential. That's our electrical signal. Traveling down a somatic motor neuron axon. So you have motor neurons, you have sensory neurons. The difference, which way signals are going. If signals are going from the brain, to a muscle or to a gland to stimulate it, that's motor. If signals are going from a receptor to the brain so that you sense something, that's sensory. A nerve is, is a bundle of neurons, or you could say a bundle of axons, which is the main component of the neuron. A generic way to, to model a neuron would be to just draw a cell body you can draw some dendrites on it. And then a really long axon. So the cell body itself will lie outside of the nerve. The nerve contains a bunch of axons bundled together. 
a nerve fiber is one axon. A nerve fiber is an axon. A nerve is a bundle of nerve fibers. So this nerve is going to carry motor output to a muscle. And once that nerve gets in the muscle, it starts branching into, into different nerve fibers. And in the end, one of these axons, one nerve fiber, is going to branch and connect with a certain number of muscle fibers, and that's going to form a motor unit. Another nerve fiber, another axon, will branch and connect with other muscle fibers to form another motor unit. So in the end, you have a ton of motor units to work with. And some motor units are going to be really big, maybe a thousand muscle fibers connected to that one motor neuron. Maybe a really small one would have five. And when we start recruiting more and more, we start small and work our way up. So we start with just a few small motor units, and if that's not generating enough force, we start recruiting more and more and more. How we do that, we'll talk about next time. The axon will branch within the muscle to serve many muscle fibers, up to hundreds, maybe even thousands. Each branch terminates as an axon terminal. The action potential, AP for short, stimulates opening of voltage-gated calcium channels along the axon terminal membrane. That allows calcium to rush into the axon terminal down its electrochemical gradient. So at this point, you don't need to know what an action potential is, how it's generated, how it's propagated. Just know it has something to do with an electrical current traveling down the cell membrane. So it's coming down the cell membrane of this axon. It reaches the axon terminals. Here's one of them. Keeps on going down the cell membrane. And as soon as it comes across these voltage-gated channels, it triggers them to open. And that's why they're called voltage-gated. Because when the electrical current comes down the membrane, it's changing the voltage of the cell membrane. At rest, it's minus 85. But when the electrical current passes through, it's a positive current because sodium is coming in. It's going to make it something more positive than minus 85. Maybe it has to go from minus 85 to minus 55 to trigger these channels to open. So we would say minus 55 is threshold for those channels. That's the point at which they open, the voltage at which they open. And that's how a voltage-gated channel works. You just have to change the membrane potential to a certain voltage, they open up. So we know depolarization, don't worry about the exact value. We know depolarization is going to open up these channels. Well, it turns out calcium, like sodium, always higher outside in the ECF, much lower in the ICF. So as soon as you open these channels, what happens to calcium? It flies into the cell, goes down its concentration gradient. So the voltage doesn't have to be positive, it just has to become more positive? Right. You don't necessarily have to go past zero to a positive value, just more positive than minus 85. And the trigger zone is somewhere around minus 50, minus 40. That's the ballpark. So calcium enters the cell by diffusion. And it's going to trigger something to happen in the cell. Not contraction, because this is not a contractile cell. But what you start to see, the pattern that you start to see, calcium is an intracellular trigger for many processes. It's a widely used chemical signal inside of cells. So what it's going to do in this particular cell, in the axon terminal, it's going to cause these vesicles to move. So they start migrating, or you could say they're mobilized. They move to the cell membrane right here, fuse with it, and then empty the contents by exocytosis. The contents being acetylcholine, the neurotransmitter. ACH has already been made, it's just stored in these vesicles, waiting for the right signal to release by exocytosis. 
And what's the signal? Depolarization of the axon terminal. That's the signal. Causes calcium channels to open, calcium comes in. Now inside of the cell, calcium is the trigger. It's the signal inside the cell. For those vesicles to mobilize, fuse and release by exocytosis. When it comes to a synapse, which this is, just a little more terminology to get there. Alright, so you know this is a synaptic cleft, right? This is the presynaptic membrane. And this is the postsynaptic membrane. Wait, what's the pre? The axon terminal membrane is the pre. So in a very general sense, whenever a neuron is communicating with another cell, which could be another neuron, they communicate at a synapse, and whichever cell is releasing the chemical, it has the presynaptic membrane. And that's where the chemical is released by exocytosis. The postsynaptic membrane, it's part of the target cell. And it's going to have receptors in that postsynaptic membrane that will bind to that neurotransmitter. So what's the name of this postsynaptic membrane? Motor and plate. Kind of has two names. Kind of. One's generic, one's specific. One is the brand name. Because if it was another neuron, it wouldn't be motor and plate. Yeah, it wouldn't be And the reason you want to know the, the terminology, you're going to use it when you describe the process. So you can say acetylcholine is released by exocytosis from the presynaptic membrane, the axon terminal. It diffuses across the synaptic cleft. It binds to receptors in the postsynaptic membrane, which is the motor end plane. Everything has a name. What would you call these receptors? Well, most, most are named after what they bind to, so you can call them ACH receptors, acetylcholine receptors. All right, so back to the study guide. We got part one, part two, part three, part four. Part four says ACH diffuses across synaptic cleft, binds to ACH receptors on the motor end plate. Junctional folds increase the surface area of the motor input. That's the point of the fold. More surface area, more receptors. Note removal of ACH via acetylcholinesterase, ACH ACE for short, removes the signal to contract, preventing continued stimulation of ACH receptors. Right, so another very general principle. Chemical messengers are meant to provide a temporary message. They should not linger around because they'll just keep stimulating that target cell indefinitely. So very quickly, all of this acetylcholine, while some of it's going to be binding to receptors, other molecules are going to bind to ACHase and be degraded. And eventually, all of them will find their way to an ACHase, which has a high bind binding affinity for this chemical. So they're going to bind to it, and when they do, they get broken down. So really, over the course of milliseconds, all of that ACH that was just released is now broken down, so the message is over. But what if you want to keep contracting that muscle over several seconds? What do you do? You just keep sending signals down the motor neuron. So as soon as this ACH starts to get broken down, another batch is being released by exocytosis. You just keep releasing it over and over and over. Then when you stop releasing it, whatever's in there quickly breaks down. And now you stop exciting the muscle cell membrane. So now with the triads, you stop releasing calcium. It goes back into storage, contraction ends. <laughs>
But ending contraction starts here at the neuromuscular junction. You have to stop stimulating that motor input. You've got to stop releasing ACH. Five, opening ligand gated cation channels, allowing sodium influx and potassium efflux. So here we're going to magnify the motor end plate. Here's the integral protein that functions both as an ACH receptor, here's ACH bound to it, but also as a ligand gated channel. So the receptor and the channel are not two separate things. They are the same thing. The same integral protein provides both functions. There's a binding site on it for ACH. The rest of it forms the channel. So you would call this a ligand-gated channel or a chemically-gated channel. What's the name of the ligand or the chemical that triggers it to open? Acetylcholine, ACH. That's the ligand. So when the channel opens, which way does sodium move? Think about its concentration rate. 